Wow. <laughs> Big audience. Good evening and a warm welcome to this very special event. My name is Kai Bird, and I'm the director of the Leon Levy Center for Biography, a wholly unique institution hosted by the Graduate Center of the City University of New York and founded by Shelby White and the Leon Levy Foundation in the year 2007. I'm gratified that Joshua Brumberg, the new interim president of the Graduate Center, is attending this event. He's somewhere here in the audience. Um, I also want to thank Thad Zelkowski, our hardworking associate director, and also thanks to Wendy DeMarco Fuentes, Karen Sander, and all the other folks at CUNY for helping us to organize this event. We are meeting tonight before a live audience, but we are also joined by hundreds, maybe thousands, of other lovers of biography who will be watching this event via live streaming. Sadly, uh, we meet in the midst of yet another devastating round of terror and war in the Middle East, where I spent part of my childhood, by the way, and I think Emma did too. Our hearts go out to all the innocent victims. Tragically, the terrible news headlines merely underscore how relevant is the topic of our conversation this evening. Robert Oppenheimer thought for a time that his terrible gadget might end all war. He was wrong. I wish it weren't so. But I am delighted now to and honored to have with us this evening Christopher Nolan and Emma Thomas. They are both graduates of University College London, where they met back in the day. Their films include such classics as Memento, Insomnia, The Prestige, Inception, Interstellar, Dunkirk, Tenet, and the Dark Knight trilogy. Nolan has been praised by many of his fellow filmmakers, including Kenneth Branagh, who starred in uh, the most recent film, who has called Nolan's approach to large-scale filmmaking, quote, unique in modern cinema, adding, quote, regardless of how popular his movies become, he remains an artist and an auteur. I think for that reason he has become a heroic figure for both the audience and the people working behind the camera. Chris and Emma have been a team since the 1990s and their films have been worldwide hits garnering five Oscar nominations and I rather think they are about to garner a few more such awards. As everyone knows, we are gathered here tonight because their most recent film, Oppenheimer, is based on American Prometheus, the book I co-authored with the late Martin J. Sherwin some 18 years ago. We are going to have a conversation for about 45 minutes, focusing on the challenge of turning biography into film. Uh, I believe note cards will be passed out to the audience at some point. Um, and if, if you have a question, please write it down and the cards will be collected around 7.10 and I'll remind everyone. And we will try to answer a few such queries. Before I, we begin, I just want to say that I think this film is a Hollywood miracle. It is cinematically riveting, but it is a piece of visual art that is deeply authentic both to the history and the man. When Chris and Emma first screened it for me in an empty IMAX theater out in LA, I watched the, thing, the whole thing for three hours and then I sat for a moment stunned at the end. Afterwards, I told them that most authors invariably say the book is better than the film. <laughs> but in this instance, my fear was that many people will say that this film is better than our 720-page biography. <laughs> I, I'm torn. <laughs> At the very least, they have taken American Prometheus and transformed it into something that the book could not pretend to achieve. It is a brilliant piece of art, and my only true regret is that my late co-author, Martin Sherwin, could not be here to see it. So on that note, I'm now gonna sit down and we're gonna have a conversation.
Can you hear me? Yes. So my first question is not for Chris, but for his producer, Emma. Emma Thomas. Tom Hanks writes in his recent novel about filmmaking, quote, making movies is complicated, maddening, highly technical at times, ephemeral and gossamer at others, slow as molasses on Wednesday, but, but with a gun to the head deadline on Friday. <laughs> I love that quote. But I have to say that observing you on set, Emma, well, your operation seems to work like clockwork. You and Chris shot this film in an incredibly short schedule. How did you do that? Um, well, I think the main job of a producer, honestly, is to hire well <laughs> and to work with people who make you look good. And um, we have an amazing crew. Um, you know, when you're making a film, you, you know, and by the way, this, it sounds crazy telling you this because for us, you know, this was two years of very intense work, but I know that that's nothing as compared with the amount of time that you spent with this story. Um, but, you know, you spend many months making plans for what can go wrong, being ready. Um, but honestly, as a sort of producer, I'm, there's the crew that we work with who are, you know, like, they are wonderful. Like, they can do anything. If ever things go down in the world, I want to be with a film crew because they can make miracles, they're resourceful, they're amazing. But the, I think, you know, sort of the, the thing that makes me look best as a producer is working with Chris because he is a director who knows exactly what he needs. He knows exactly what he wants. I think it helps that he writes as well. He knows what he needs to tell the story. He knows, he knows what the audience needs to see. Um, and he's incredibly well prepared. And so... Although, you know, you, when you came to visit us, I think when we were in Los Alamos, didn't you? Right. And um, there are a million things going on, but Chris is always able to keep in his head what he needs for that, the big screen. And he, he remains resolutely calm in the face of all sorts of insanity. And, and he makes but, me But you're good. a hands-on producer. You're the buffer between all this craziness and Chris, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that probably when we're, in, when we're shooting, my, I, f I see my job as being a facilitator for his vision. So he's the one that has the idea about what the film is that he wants to, to be showing, and I'm, I'm there to allow that vision to come to life. Or not allow that. Say no, yes. There aren't that many people on set who say no to the director, and Emma <laughs> is that person on set, so... Um, <laughs> No, and I think part of what, what you're getting at when you talk about hiring well and, and our department heads and how that helps with our efficiency, I think part of that is because we together in pre-production make it very clear to them that the constraints, the practical constraints of being on budget and being on time, as a, as a filmmaker, I embrace that and I enjoy that and I want to use that as part of the creative impetus. It's, it's what our friend... Tasta Dean, the artist, talks about as the resistance of the medium. In other words, if you're sculpting in clay, the clay pushes back in a particular way and that, that changes how you sculpt with it. And for me in filmmaking, the practical restrictions, which are the things that producers always have sort of laid at their door, we've made it clear to our collaborators that, that we're not going to try and circumvent those or deny those. We're going to try and, and work within them and channel our creativity through that. And, and I think the fact that we together make that clear to them, when we hit the floor, there's a, there's a good understanding that we're going, to, we're going to keep moving in the way we're moving. If the weather's bad, we're going to shoot anyway. If the conditions aren't exactly what we want, we're going to carry on. And we're just going to find our way through. And, right. and as you, you have say, a schedule and you're... Yeah. So you shot this film in how many days of filming? Gosh, how many? Uh, 53, was it in the end? Or it was 57. 57. 57 days. It was, yeah, it, was, it, was, it was very, very tight. But again, it was efficient. It moved fast. There was no time to be bored, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. It, no, it was fast and efficient, but it was also, you know, you're working with an ensemble. You're doing scenes with, you know, five actors, eight actors, ten actors. And there's only so long that you can maintain that energy, that group energy. And so having a longer schedule, I don't think it would have helped the bulk of the scenes. 
um, because you tend to get bogged down in group conversations very much with eye lines and coverage and who's close up you're doing and everything. But what you really need to maintain is group energy. It's these scientists all challenging each other, arguing, you know, all of that. And that worked well fast. That worked well knowing, okay, we've got to do this by lunch and then go somewhere else. Um, I think really our, our director of photography, Jorge van Hoytema, he was an incredible ally in terms of in pre-production, once again, understanding how we wanted to work. He then took that on and said, okay, well, let's have no steady cam, let's have no cranes, let's just you know, do this single camera in a very stripped down way, laying dolly tracks, handheld camera, you know, no video village, uh, you know, the it's monitors. It's a very offset. intimate film, it, lots of close-ups and... Yes. So what, what, are, what are the particular challenges of, uh, of filming a biography as opposed to producing a film on, on like Dunkirk or Interstellar? I mean, biography is all about trying to capture that person and... We had really good source material. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to say. I um, wasn't fishing for a compliment there. <laughs> um, I think for me, I think that the, the, the big distinction between this film and, and some of the others that we've made is that, you know, you know, again, I go back to the thing, we've worked on this film for two years. You were on it for, you know, decades. Only 25. <laughs> 25. <laughs> and, you know, so there's a sort of, there's a responsibility to you. There's a responsibility to Oppenheimer himself. Um, and then the story of Oppenheimer is, a, you know, a, a story that can be devastating. I mean, it's not a sort of, you know, we were releasing this film in, in the summer. So we were trying to make a film that would bring people into theatres and entertain them whilst also being true to the big issues at play um, in, in his life. Um, and I think that that was a, you know, really the sort of the big challenge, but... Chris wrote a fantastic script which managed to synthesize everything that you had written and, and managed to bring people in. And, and, you know, it's been amazing to speak to people since the movie came out, young people, old people, you know, saying that they've seen it multiple times and it really meant something. So, Chris, uh, I know you were once interested in doing a biopic about Howard Hughes, mm -hmm. and then you had to abandon it. But... Please begin by telling us how you came to the Oppenheimer biography. I know, you, you know you've been interested in science fiction and time and space and memory, but what brought you to Oppenheimer? Well, I, um, I've been aware of, of Oppenheimer as a figure uh, and, and not knowing that much about him, but loosely interested in him for a very long time. And in my last film, science fiction film called Tenet, we actually referred to Oppenheimer in dialogue and it referred to that moment where the scientists of the Manhattan Project sort of have that discussion about can we be entirely sure that we won't set fire to the atmosphere when we trigger this. Um, and I think having, having put that in a film and used that as a sort of metaphor for what, what the science fiction film conceit was, because Tenet is a film that's all about the manipulation of time to be able to undo terrible things. It's, it's really about, it's about the frustration that we can't uninvent the nuclear bomb, we can't undo what, what Oppenheimer did. Um, as a rap gift, Robert Pattinson, who's in that film, gave me a book of uh, Oppenheimer's speeches from the early 50s, and reading those, I was so struck by the the moment at which he's speaking, this moment where this terrible thing has been unleashed on the world and they're trying to deal with it, quantify it, understand it, make rules about it, you know, this kind of thing. And you thought, what a, what a terrible time, a terrible moment for the world. Um, and then uh, our friend Chuck Roven, who we produced the Dark Knight trilogy with, um, gave us a copy of American Prometheus, suggested we read it with a view to, you know, could it be a film? That was it? in early 21? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I read it and, you know, it's a very brilliant book and it's very, uh, very well structured, I think, and, and uh, deceptively simple in its structure, as I found when I had to adapt it. But uh, as you, you pass through it, you reach this moment relatively early where 
you know, you're coming to understand that Los Alamos was this place that he and Frank would go and go camping and, and for its scenic beauty and everything. And I think I was absolutely convinced from that moment onwards because of the personal connection. You know, you can argue the toss about the sort of key person of history clause, you know, would the bomb have happened without Oppenheimer? Would have, you know, so many people are involved in, the, in this creation. But to see that Los Alamos, this, this place that we've all heard of for, for this awesome and terrible reason, uh, the connection with him, you know, he literally was just a place he liked to, to go camping. Oh, Los That's Alamos remarkable. is a very spooky place. And, uh, <laughs> I, but I, I remember reading that you actually, in the summer of 21, when you were working on the screenplay, without my knowledge, <laughs> uh, uh, that was a surprise. Um, you, you took a trip with your son to actually visit Los Alamos, is that true? Yeah, I mean, I was about halfway through the script and I, and I um, you know, it was getting difficult as script writing does, um, but it's difficult when you're, when you're adapting a work and you're telling a real life story. Uh, it's a different, you're not stuck, you know what happens next, it's just about, well, how how are you going to portray it? How are you going to compress it? You know, those kind of things. And I felt like, yeah, I needed a bit more of a connection with the reality of it. Uh, and so my son Magnus and I, we took a road trip and drove out um, to New Mexico, went to Los Alamos, um, it looked at the museum there, looked at Fuller Lodge, and then, um, I don't know if I'm supposed to admit this, but Oppenheimer's house was empty at the time and had been acquired by the museum, but they hadn't done anything with it yet. So. Um, I sort of left Magnus on guard and I jumped the fence and kind of went and took pictures through the windows and you know well because it was just this piece of history right, right there um, and it's a very tiny house too. it's a tiny house and it did originally have no kitchen you know when they moved in because it was a, a faculty member's house and they ate at Fuller Lodge so there was no kitchen all that stuff is true and it's tiny and it's exactly as it was really. I mean, they did add a kitchen at some point in the 50s, I think, um, a proper kitchen, but it's really very much the way it would have been. There's even some of the same furniture or what looks like the same furniture as from the photographs. And so it's now part of the tour. So if you go to Los Alamos, you can, you can go there, but, but to be there for the actors, to be there for all of us, to, to be in this, this place uh, and Well, yeah, because to be clear, I mean, we haven't said, but we actually shot in that house. I mean, you visited in pre-production, but I visited and sneaked, actually... sneaked a peek, and yes, it's a, a long way around. We built our version of Los Alamos, because we had to, because the town of Los Alamos is pretty modern now. Um, and originally, we we're gonna build exteriors and interiors on our set. For budget reasons, for practicality, Ruth de Jong, our designer, realized that actually, if we built the exteriors, but actually went to the real Los Alamos to shoot the interiors, that would be cheaper, that would save us money and be more practical. So we shot in Fuller Lodge. Um, we shot in, you know, Oppie and Kitty's house. Uh, and that was, that was just an amazing privilege. So how long did it actually take you to write the screenplay? If you first read the book in early 21, you, it was just a matter of spring and summer? It was essentially a matter of spring and summer. Um, I, my process, particularly working from the book, uh, you know, my process was to write a lot of notes, a lot of thoughts, a lot of diagrams and things, spend time thinking about the structure before I ever started writing. Then when I started writing, it went, went reasonably fast, but... Um, it's an amazing script, and, and it's just amazing that you wrote it so quickly. <laughs> I mean, you know, there were, I, I should say, I, I'm, I'm amazed that you were able to do such a screenplay, in particular because I know that there were several other attempts to make this movie over the years, and they all failed. It was too difficult to do this big iconic figure. Everyone else stumbled and you came along and wrote the script in four months. <laughs> I did, but the research took 25 years. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, you're standing on the shoulders of giants. I mean, truly. Uh, and well, so, thank you. But, but also, um, on, you know, you referred to my Howard Hughes screenplay that I wrote. And the reality is, you know, as I said to Emma, I said to Chuck when we first embarked on this, is that screenplay took me a year to write. And I was working for a book by Richard Hack, and I was banging my head against the wall for an entire year. 
and then finally figured it out structurally how to compress all this stuff, how to view a person's life in a prismatic way so that you feel that you've, you've seen all the bits you need to see. Um, and coming, that was almost the first draft for this in a way. You, you know, the, they're completely different people, uh, obviously, but the, the challenge was the same. The iconography versus the intimacy behind that, uh, the prismatic approach that allows you to shorthand sections but still feel that you've engaged with those aspects of the person's life. And so I, you know, that's a, a screenplay that, you know, I mean, the history of it is I, I finished the screenplay and then Scorsese's movie got going like the next week or something. So I had no way to be able to make it. Uh, and I would revisit it over the years. And so I think with this, I saw an opportunity to build on, on because I'd been happy with that script. I felt like I'd cracked something, like I knew how to do something. And so in a way I'd done a first draft already. And, and that's why I was able to really dive into this. I, I knew how to do it. And that, that is the difficulty of m making movies. I mean, sometimes you can have a fantastic script, but for whatever reason, the time is not right. And I feel like with this movie, we just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Chris just, you know, m he managed to write this great script, which I think did sort of, you know, was well, on the, the back of your work and his previous work, and then we were able to get it made. And, and I don't think all filmmakers would have been able to get this film made at this time. So the, the screenplay has actually just been published by Faber and Faber in London. Uh, it's a 220-page book. It's a long screenplay, but a short book. Um, and I reread it recently, and you know, it's it, it's really just amazing, an incredibly uh, well done script. And it's written the the side notes, the instructions are all written in the first person, in Oppenheimer's voice, which is kind of spooky. I, <laughs> how did you decide to do that? Well, I, um, I knew I didn't want to use voiceover, but I wanted to be utterly subjective in the way I told the story. And from Oppenheimer's point of view. From Oppenheimer's point of view. I wanted to really tell, certainly all the color sequences, they needed to be from Oppenheimer's point of view. And this, the screenplay format, it's something that I think a lot of, particularly writer-directors, a lot of filmmakers over the years have struggled with it. Because it's wonderful for certain things and not others. And the, the, the dirty secret of kind of Hollywood and Hollywood screenplays is people only read the dialogue. So, well, you're talking about executives who read 15 scripts a week, you know, assistants who have to read, you know, five scripts over the weekend or whatever. I started off as a script reader, um, you know, and you'd have to do a couple scripts a day. You, you tend to read the dialogue, not the stage directions. Now, I have made films ever since following and memento, I've made films where the stage directions, if you don't read them, you don't understand the film in the slightest. So I've always been struggling for ways to sort of embrace that or bring that in as part of the narrative. And at some point I was about a third of the way into the story. Um, and yeah, I was over in London with Jonah. We were quarantining in the house together. And I, I, it suddenly just sort of occurred to me, you know what? Let me try this. Let's try doing it in the first person the way a voiceover would be, but not a voiceover, just an indication for me and the reader. You know, this feeling. And the actors. And the actors and everyone in the crew, you know, everybody who would then encounter it. So every day when we would look at it, you know, and I, and I showed without, without telling Jonah why I was showing it to him, we should have showed him that first third. And, and he got it and was like, no, this, this works. And so I carried on with it. And I think it really helped us because these decisions about subjectivity, you know, on the day when you come to shoot this conversation or whatever, and you're deciding, okay, is the camera, is it gonna be close to this character, near that character? Th those decisions needed to be made in a very formalized way. And so, you know, we have script pages on set called sides that sort of reduce script pages and you stick them in your pocket every day. The actors have them, director of photography has them, sound guy has them, you know. Um, and every time we would refer to them, it would just put you back in his head. And I think for all of us, it was just a, a really great reminder of how we wanted to tell this story. Yeah, put him back in, in his head. That, that's what Killian Murphy did. I mean, he, that performance was just uh, so riveting. And, you know, it, I could recognize my Oppenheimer, although it was, and I remember telling Killian when I met him just for 
two minutes on the set that day in Los Alamos that he had captured Oppenheimer's voice, that sort of very calm, soft-spoken, articulate, every syllable uh, spoken. And uh, he responded very sweetly. He says, well, thank you, but you know, we try not to mimic. <laughs> yeah. We try to capture the spirit of the voice. And anyway, it was, the film is very intimate. I find yeah. it is, and I, I mean it's it's an interesting point you raise about how he approached the performance because we did talk together about how imitation and mimicry and impersonation of Oppenheimer would be of no help to us um, because you can mimic the 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 form of an individual, the way they look or the way they sound, without projecting the essence of of who they are. And so my feeling was. You know, Killian has a certain physical resemblance to him. He has these incredible eyes that Oppenheimer had and cheekbones. the cheekbones. And, and that's done, you know, I mean, other than the fact that he, he did lose a lot of weight for the, <laughs> the part and have to keep it off through the, the shoot. But broadly speaking, it's like there's enough of a resemblance. Let's now, you know, feel free to project the truth of the character and just, just and, and even things like the voice, I think there's a really fascinating combination in what he's doing with having listened and researched the way the real person sounded. Although, of course, there's almost no, there really isn't any tape of Oppenheimer speaking intimately. And so as Killian speeches, would point out to me, yeah. everything is speeches. And he was a very, very theatrical individual. And so you have to take that into account. And what I saw Killian doing was modulating that really expertly. So he was sort of taking his public persona and then seeing behind that, jumping behind that and finding the, the private moment. And um, yeah, I, I think he just did a phenomenal job, I mean, of, of finding all, the truth. All the actors did. Yeah. Uh, Robert Downey Jr.'s portrayal of the evil Louis Straws, you know, it wasn't a caricature. He came across as a complicated, Evil character, and well, and uh, he would he would dispute your characterization of evil. I mean, he he right. really, I think, fell in love with the character, and I and yeah. I think to find the truth of a person and project that for an actor, they they have to find something to love, and he really, I think, yeah, came to represent his point of view, came to understand that that character in a lot of ways. His sort of insecurities, Strauss's insecurities about his education, his lack of education, his. Um, yeah. So, given the success of Oppenheimer, which is just phenomenal globally, is this going to encourage Hollywood to make more biographies, more serious <laughs> films based on biographical books? My biography fellows want to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't buy the speedboat just yet. But I think. Uh, no, I think, I think the, the truth is any time a film succeeds that isn't expected to succeed, uh, it, it's, a, it's an encouraging thing for Hollywood in, in every which way. It's an encouraging thing for filmmakers. Um, for a while now, filmmakers, well, this is always the tension in Hollywood between the familiar and what is predicted to make money, and that's the sort of meat and potatoes of how the studios stay in business. But there's always this desire on the part of audiences for something new as well, uh, something fresh. Uh, and so any time uh, a film that isn't expected to succeed, and, and we vastly exceeded you know, our, our highest expectations for the project, um, that's encouraging for everybody. It's encouraging for the studios, it's encouraging for other filmmakers. Um, but that tension and that reality, I mean, I don't you know, you should weigh in, but I think that reality of the, the tension between commerce and art, if you like, or whatever, that formula never really changes in Hollywood because it's just a, it's just a reality of the industrial process. Films are very expensive to make. So, Emma, that brings me to the writer's strike, which is now over, thankfully, but the actors are still on strike. And this sort of leads me to ask you, Ideally, is there a rational business model for what Hollywood should look like, how they should be in the business of making films? And, you know, I guess this gets, you have to address the economics of streaming and the larger question of, you know, do 
big screen theaters have a future? I mean, I, I think absolutely resoundingly yes is the answer to the question about theatres, and I think that that's what this summer has really shown. Um, you know, I'm not sure that what sort of films are going to be on those screens. I'm hoping it is going to be sort of new and fresh and, and whatever form that takes. Um, we've been in this sort of five-year period, but definitely in the last three years, a particular sort of period of flux. And there's been a great deal of sort of chasing after streaming on the part of the studios. And, you know, we've been hearing for years, you know, now that streaming is, is, is the way of the future. People want to watch movies in their homes. Theatres are dead. Kids don't have the attention spans to watch a film beyond, you know, I mean, three hours. Imagine that. Um, and... Um, that, you know, as a result, the studios have been leaving money on the table, and I think that the strikes have been part of a sort of correction of sorts. Um, there's, Chris has often said that, you know, basically people haven't, the, the studios have not been reckoning with the actual cost of, the, of making films. They haven't been paying people properly. Um, and they've been losing money on And screen. they've been losing money because they haven't been, you know, they've been looking at their share prices rather than the actual money that's coming in and therefore they've been leaving money on the table. I think what this summer and the success of this film and, and some of the others this, this year has shown is that there is a desire for people to leave their houses, to have a collective experience, to be you know, transported to a different world, whatever that may be, um, to be engaged in, in somebody else's story beyond their own and to be inspired, and um, so for that reason, I feel very positive about the way forward. And 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 Hollywood is nothing if not a business that copies what's succeeded. You know, they were very good at sort of looking at what's worked and slavishly following that. So yes, hopefully that means that there'll be many more you know big movies in theaters. Chris, do you want to weigh in on this? I I think everything Emma said. Uh, summarize it very neatly the the one thing that's worth pointing out on top of that is you know our business has suffered the same form of economic disruption that the tech industry has brought in, in many other areas of life from taxi cabs to you know restaurants and the music business in particular the music business tends to run about 10 years ahead of the movie business in, in its distribution models and ultimately all of those systems have been affected by companies that are able to give away their product or appear to give away their product, not charge for it in the conventional way. And so when you apply that model to an, a well-established mature industry like filmmaking, film distribution, it's not a tech industry. It doesn't need a tech valuation, what Kendall Roy would call a tech valuation. It's an established thing. We know how much it costs to make. We know how much we need to charge people for it to work. We know how much we need to sell it on TV and license fees and everything to, to make it that will balance. In the last few years, that balance has completely been upset. And I think Wall Street has now realized that actually it has to go back to more of a licensing model. The funny thing is, none of that has anything to do with feature films. It's all about TV. So you've got all of these media companies, and the same companies who pay for features, but they're all trying to figure out how to get you to pay the same for streaming that you pay for cable. And that's their big problem. And they keep using feature films as a distraction. We'll break the window, we'll do this, we'll do that. The world's changing, all the rest. We work in a mature business. I like to say we're, we're Heinz, we make ketchup. You know, we're not a tech company. The innovation in our industry has always been and should always be what goes on the screen not what the screen is, not what the seats are, not whether they've got two drinks cups holders or one or whatever. That's all irrelevant. It's, it's what we do as filmmakers and what we put on the screen. That's where the potential is infinite and needs to be explored. Well, in Washington, D.C., where I was just at, the, the biggest theater in town is the Uptown on Connecticut Avenue. And it closed during the pandemic, and it's still shuttered. It's, uh, and the, the other big theater is the Avalon, and it is open, but the only reason it's open is that the Neighborhood Association formed a nonprofit to fund the theater so that people could see theater collectively, as you said, Emma. So, but you still have a, a optimism that theaters can survive economically. Well, I, we'd be, in a, we'd be 
making a strange statement having made almost a billion dollars on the film if we didn't believe that. So <laughs> clearly, clearly okay, it's working. Okay, touche. So. And, and, by, and by the way, I mean, you know, it's also on the studios to keep them going. And the way they can keep them going is by putting movies out. We've been in this very weird position over the last couple of years where they haven't been putting movies in theaters, you know, I mean. Well, and, and Taylor Swift is about to show the studios because that's not, her concert film is not being distributed by the studios, it's being distributed by the theater owner, AMC. Wow. And it's going to make an enormous amount of money. And this is the thing, this, this is a format, this is a way of seeing things and sharing stories or sharing experiences that's incredibly valuable. And if they don't want it, somebody else will. So that's, that's just the truth of it. So let's now turn to a few questions about the film Oppenheimer in terms of what was in it and what was not. Um, in particular, I know a few critics have suggested that uh, somehow the film should have shown what happened to people on the ground in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And uh, I personally, I disagree. I think that if you had shown old news clips of the devas devastated city of Hiroshima taken a few weeks after the bombing, it would have trivialized the, the, what had happened. All you see are these broken buildings. Um, and instead you, uh, well, in, explain what you did in, 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 instead. Well, in, in looking at it from a script point of view and taking the cue from the book to some degree because both you and Marty had written about Hiroshima and Nagasaki extensively outside of the biography of Oppenheimer. And there's a reason for that because, and reading about his experience and how essentially once Trinity was done, he was to some degree in the same position as the rest of America. He heard about the bombing of Hiroshima on the radio as Truman announced it. And that was one of the most remarkable things I saw in the book. And it was one of the things that really prompted me to want to tell the story as subjectively as possible. I wanted to experience the realizations that he passes through with him and have the audience do that. And I think, you know, largely that's been the way that audiences have responded to it. Um, I think that as a filmmaker, you know, you make certain choices and you have to make them as strongly and as firmly as possible uh, and make your intentions as clear as possible. But once the film goes out in the world, it's up to the audience to, to make of it what they will and get the experience from it that they well, will. Well, what you did forced the audience to imagine for themselves what it would be like to be under that bomb. And so you have Oppenheimer imagining in this uh, scene where the woman's face, who happens to be his daughter, right? <laughs> Your daughter. Our daughter. I, yeah, I mean, I, you know, the, the, the truth is that everything to do with film and editing and all the editorial choices you're making on a technical level is as much about what you don't show as what you do show. I mean, you know, horror movies being the obvious example where if you show too much of something, it's not frightening, it's not threatening. But even when you're cutting a sequence of somebody walking into a room, sitting down, having a conversation, you're eliminating everything um, that you possibly can. You're streamlining and you're also allowing things to have more resonance or more power through what you don't show, uh, whether you're talking about an act of physical violence or you know, whatever. I mean, they're just certain things. Everything in editing is, is about that. And as a screenwriter, I come to it with a really, a very strong sense of the filmmaking, the editing that's going to have to result. And so when I'm writing the script, I'm, I'm going through that process. So these are not things that are uh, found in the edit suite. There are plenty of discoveries that my editor, Jen Lehman, and myself have made while we were putting the film together. Editing's an incredibly difficult and important part of the process, obviously. But the big decisions, the key decisions, for me, have to be made at script stage uh, and therefore inform the way you shoot the film. Right. So I just want to take a moment to remind people that ushers are walking around, passing out, picking up your notes, your questions that we'll get to. Um, so here's another question that the film, I think, does address, but it's not a heavy history lesson. You don't, 
you know, pound us over the head with it. But the question of was the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki necessary? You know, Marty and I in the book devote scores of pages to this question. Uh, looking at all the evidence, and and you have Oppie saying to Edward Teller at one point, just one line, which seems to capture the whole argument, which is Oppie says, well, we bombed an enemy that was essentially defeated. Yes, Stimson's now telling us we bombed an enemy, and, and I don't know if you remember, but the line is in the film because you told me to put it in the film. <laughs> and... No, and, and frankly, it's the only thing, it's, it's really the only note you had for me when you read the script, and your point was, you know, the, the film is trying to ride this very fine line in the discussion of acknowledging the complexity of the argument. Um, and your point, and it was well taken, was that essentially defeated, you know, that it's a powerful statement, and it, you felt rightly that it was one thing that needed to be added on that scale to achieve the proper balance. And interestingly, when I shot that scene with Killian, we shot, because I had not bothered to write it into the script correctly, I was working very fast, all the rest, I just had a note somewhere in my script to do it. Uh, I sort of sprung it on him, you know, take five or take six or something. And he incorporated it, and then when we finished the close-up and moved on to something else, he sort of came up to me and said, yeah, that, that made it work. That made the scene work for him. Because it, it explains something about his disillusionment. It's, it's a heavy scene. It comes on the heels of him, you know, seeing the results of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, seeing the slideshow that he, he sort of refuses to look at. And um, for him, it made sense of the swirl of emotions that the character would be feeling to know that, Stimson, whose office they had sat in and discussed, you know, the the, uh, the bombing. That's just how cities. close the Japanese were to surrendering. Yeah. Precisely, and for Stimson to then, essentially, almost sort of pull the rug. And your point is, by that period, you know, you were telling me the exact time, you know, by which he would have had that conversation with Stimson. That changes a lot in terms of how he views things. Yeah. So it it's amazing. It brilliantly captures in one line sort of the ambiguity that Oppenheimer himself was, was feeling and the complexity of the history that we, Marty and I, were trying to convey in the book. You, you can't use the word brilliant when it's your line. <laughs> I can do that. No, 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 it was Oppenheimer's line. <laughs> well, actually, I mean, in the, the Stimson scene uh, as a whole, um, Stimson is played by James Remar, wonderful actor, and I had not worked with him before. And in the scene as written, he crosses Kyoto off the list because of its significance to Japanese people. And James kept saying to me that he had discovered this fact that, that uh, Stimson and his wife honeymooned in Kyoto, and that was you know, part of what's behind it. And I finally just said, well, yeah, you should say that. So he incorporated it into the scene and therefore wrote maybe the best line in the film, yeah, the it's, second best. It's a powerful, powerful <laughs> line. Well, you also have Teller quoting to Oppenheimer, uh, PMS Blackett, the famous British physicist who was the subject of the poison apple incident. But anyway, you have Teller quoting Blackett saying that the atomic bombings were, quote, the first act of this Cold War with Russia. And there you're signaling to, I mean, it's a very quick line. It's very brief, but it signals to your audience, oh, this whole revisionist school of thought about the atomic bombings. And so I was just Which, which very happened pleased. very quickly, very soon, you know, and, and that was part of the point. But the other thing is, is his story and, and yours and Marty's account of it is full of these incredible relationships between things in his life. And so the idea that this tutor that he had this complicated relationship with around the poison apple incident uh, would then be the first prominent critic to point out the Cold War implications of the bomb rather than as it related to, to defeating Japan. That, you know, if I as a screenwriter wrote that 
in a fictional film, no one would buy it. You know, I mean, it, and, and so much of Oppenheimer's story is that stranger than fiction. It really is. I mean, the, the brings fact it that, full circle. Well, the fact that he published he published his his you know and Hartland Snyder's paper about what would later be termed black holes in the same day that Hitler invi invaded Poland. Like these are things that you would never invent as a screenwriter. You would never dare put things as neat as that. And his story is full of these these patterns, and and you know it made my my job very enjoyable, very very easy. So I was also really pleased, and I'm sure if Marty was here, he'd be ecstatic that your script gave so much space to the trial, to the 1954 kangaroo court proceeding that brought Oppenheimer down. You know, Marty always emphasized to me at one point when we were writing the book, he turned to me and he says, you know, we wouldn't be spending all these years on this book if it was just about the making of this gadget, if it was just about the Manhattan Project. Uh, what gave the story an arc was the fact that he was nine years after being hailed as this brilliant America's most famous scientist, nine years later he was humiliated in this terrible proceeding. And the, you, you capture it in, very well in that. But you also uh, went on to do more research. I don't know if it was Emma or Chris. Not but me. it was him. <laughs> Uh, and you did some research that Marty and I failed to do. <laughs> you know, we, we address at the end of the book the fact that uh, five years after the 54 hearing, uh, Louis Straws, who had manipulated the whole and orchestrated the hearing, five years later he is nominated to be Commerce Secretary at, by Eisenhower and goes through a confirmation hearing. And we wrote in a couple of paragraphs, we described that and pointed out that he lost the confirmation vote narrowly, citing in particular the vote of a young senator from Massachusetts named John F. Kennedy. Uh, but you then went and did further research. I guess you got curious about that. Tell that story. Well, what, you know, what you're referring to from your book is exactly what I'm talking about. It's, it's the, the symmetry. And it's there, yes, it's a brief thing in your book, but you point out to some degree the parallels or the, or the poetic justice, call it that. And that, that when you're, you know, for me, the, the challenge with this is, well, how do you end? You know, where are you going with, with this? Because you're not going to end with Trinity or Hiroshima, the, the security hearings for Oppenheimer and everything. But you can't just end with the end of that. Um, and so... I wanted to know more about it. I wanted to look at the congressional record, look at the Senate hearings, look at what was said. I got interested in the parallelism because it slightly seems off the point, but it becomes very relevant, which is when you hear about the security hearings or you kind of half know about it, you imagine a room like this, a courtroom, you know, shafts of sunlight coming through Venetian blinds and lawyers making big speeches and everything. And then, as you described in the book, you're like, it could not be further from that. It's this crappy little porter cabin on the moor, you know, absolutely. I mean, Strauss really knew to not give Oppenheimer a platform and all the rest. So the contrast with the Senate hearings, the geographical contrast, where they were in this, you know, magnificent hearing room and all the press is there and cameras there, all the stuff Strauss did not allow Oppenheimer is, is there. So the parallelism became interesting to me. So I, I wanted to find out more about the hearings and in, and in researching it and looking at the records and looking at the transcripts, it became apparent that a couple of scientists, I, I only included David Hill because I needed to reduce it to one, but there's also scientists named Inglis who, you know, they stood up there in front of their political leaders and their whole country and stood up you know, for the scientific community against this very, very powerful, you know, Washington personality. And, you know, I thought, generally, that's a, a remarkable thing. Um, and the fact that, that Hill had been based in Chicago hadn't really been one of Oppenheimer's acolytes. There's very little information about him available, actually. Um, but the, that he had done this. You found the transcript. Of the I found the transcript. So everything, everything he says in the movie, it's exactly what he said. I mean, I've had to cut it down slightly. Rami Malek, who, who plays him, he learned the entire speech. Um, but 
you know, I, I had to trim it down, but, but there's nothing in there that's invented. You know, he stood up and he said these things, and it was very important. It wasn't the only reason that Strauss was, you know, wasn't confirmed, absolutely. There were all kinds of other political things going on. But to me, what that showed, and I wanted to include it in the film for this reason, is he did it because he was a scientist and because scientists were appalled by what had happened to Oppenheimer. And that coming together, and you see it with Einstein as well, that, that coming together in the scientific community to defend one of their own is being wronged for his ideas and for his opinions. Uh, I think that speaks very highly of the scientific community. It was a difficult time in which somebody would, would make a statement like that. No, it's a powerful testimony that Rami Malek uh, uses to tell the story of what happened. And, and it's still relevant to our times today because of uh, the, the role in, of scientists in our society. And we saw this during the pandemic, the way scientists like uh, public health officials uh, were questioned f about their integrity and truthfulness. And, and they're just trying to do science. They're trying to, and, and I think some of that comes back in, to the fact that Oppenheimer was treated in this manner and uh, defrocked in, in, in his own church in the wor words of Edward Teller. So it, it's, that's again a, a reason why this story is so relevant to our own times. So uh, we're running out of time, but I have s a few more questions and we should get to some uh, questions for some from the audience. Um, you know, your script was, your, your, your film was three hours, but the original screenplay was even longer. <laughs> uh, in retrospect, if you'd had another 30 minutes, w were there things w that you would have <laughs> saved? I mean, uh, no, I, I, the, the script, when we hit the floor, as we say, was 180 pages, which at a page a minute, which is the formula you use in filmmaking, is exactly three hours, obviously. So that we, we I, I said to you over that summer, when you'd read longer and longer versions, I, I said, I have to write this script differently than any other script I've ever written. I have to write a long film. I have to write a three hour film. Because if I try and write a fast paced, shorter version and stuff all this story into it, it's gonna be boring. I actually have to pace it correctly for the audience. I have to pace it like a, you know, as a longer film, which I'd never really done before. I've made long films before, but they've always been sort of desperately crushed together. <laughs> you know, very, very quick editing, very, you know, trying to be ruthlessly efficient with everything. This needed to breathe a bit, and I, you know, your reaction wasn't great, as I recall. No, but I, think I wasn't. I wasn't thrilled. <laughs> um, you were not thrilled about a three-hour film? I was not thrilled about a three-hour film. No, I mean, you know, you're kind of thinking about well, how, many screenings, <laughs> how many screenings you can fit in in a day and, you know, things like yeah. that. And then we had other issues like, you know, how long is, how big is an IMAX platter? And, you know, there are all sorts of considerations. Um, but... Well, that's the short answer to the extra <laughs> half an hour. Yeah, it wouldn't, exactly. it literally we wouldn't couldn't... have been... I was determined, we were determined to have these film prints out there. And three hours was the absolute maximum they could give us, but... Well, I know you told me the first time we met, I, uh, you weren't sharing the script with me at that point, and, uh, but you were taking questions. Emma, you weren't there. And uh, I asked, well, do you have Oppenheimer's famous toast in the script, the, to the confusion of my enemies? <laughs> <laughs> and your answer was, well, yes, it was in the script, but I just had to cut it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the thing. There, there, there are a lot of things, that, you know, if you had a much longer period of time, if you were doing a, a television program, for example, over many weeks or something, you'd approach it in a different way. And, that, and that's the conversation we were having about the pacing of the screenplay. You know, we make theatrical films. They have a particular form to them, uh, even though films can be anything and different genres, different lengths and all the rest. And we knew that there's a world in which a three hour film works for an audience. Uh, most successful film domestically was Avengers Endgame, three hours and two minutes. You know, I mean, that's the thing. There are plenty of very long, successful movies. They tend to have a bit more action going on. Than, than <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, I mean, I, 
sort of, in theory, three hours seemed like too much to me. I am the sort of person who falls asleep at nine o'clock at night, and I, you know, I, I, I look at movies, I look at their, their, their length, running length. Of course, when we then made the film, and we go through a process in post where we watch the film every Friday for many months to get the right version of the film, and I had to, you know, admit that once I saw the three-hour version, it was the right length for this film. And in all the many times that we've watched this film, and I, I think I can really only say this about this film of all of the films that we've made, I never once objected to watching the film again. And every time I saw it, I was seeing new details, new elements of performance that I hadn't seen before. And, you know, you can watch a, a movie that's 90 minutes long that feels too long. You know, you can see a three-hour film that feels too short. You know, this was the right amount of time for this particular story. Well, I've seen it five times, and only. <laughs> and every time I see it, I, I realize I'm, I find things that I missed. You know, a, a line, the dialogue is very fast, uh, a little scene of some guy in the back of the room banging on a bongo. Well, that's Richard Feynman, but you don't bother to explain who he is. It's just, you know, we know that Richard Feynman took his bongo to <laughs> Fuller Lodge and banged on it, and, and there he is. Well, this is the, the great advantage, which we avail ourselves of, of, of working uh, from biography, working with real people. Uh, are about real people, which is that every actor, you know, it's an incredible ensemble that we put together. Yes, the stars at the heart of it, but also all of these different, like Jack Quaid, who plays Richard Feynman, they all came to set every day knowing more about their characters than, than I did. And I encouraged that and, and was very pleased to have that um, because it meant that all of those discussions, all the sort of life of it can can be much richer or much than, than a screenwriter. You know, normally if, if I've you know, written a fictional screenplay, I have to be the expert on every character. And yes, you can collaborate with an actor and you can give them indications and they can come up with, you know, some kind of backstory. These actors were able to, to research in great detail everything about the people they were playing. And so they would come to the floor every day keen to demonstrate that, keen to show that. And so it well, all becomes richer. Yeah. And so as I watched the film, and I concur with everything Emma was saying, I, uh, you know, we watch our films again and again and again, because we have to. And this, this story never got old for me. And I think it's because it wasn't my story. You know, it was our story, it's Oppenheimer's story. And so yes, you're seeing things in the performances, you're seeing what people have brought to the table that has a reality, it makes you think about things. Because a lot of the dialogue, particularly, the Senate hearings, but also the, uh, the security hearings, you know, they're from the transcripts. They're not dialogue that I'm inventing. Yes, I'm editing it, I'm trying to make it digestible, but I really wanted to use the real world words. And so what Edward Teller says about, you know, his answer to the question about would you, you know, would you clear Oppenheimer, you know, he's, he, that's exactly what he said. And so I get to experience that myself and wonder about that and think about sort of how dare he and how, you know, the prevarication that's there and the way that he expresses himself. So I'm going to ask you one more question and then get to the uh, audience questions. Why were there no, I mean, you made a conscious decision, I guess, why were there no childhood scenes? And I guess... Three hours. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but you, I yeah. think you managed to find a substitute, which was the poison apple incident. Yeah. When he's 22 years old. And so with that... He was a brief, late bloomer, as you He's know. a late bloomer. So you can count that as childhood, I think. And you get a sense of his vulnerability from yeah. that. There's a tendency in biography, written biography, that I think you avoided very well in, in your book. But there is a tendency post-Freud to attribute characteristics to the person you're dealing with, attributed simply from their genetics, simply from their parents. And it's a, very, it's a very reductive view of a human being. And when you, you know, if you're writing a book that's 500 pages, 1,000 pages, there's a way to balance that with their individuality, with their experiences. When you compress and strip down to the necessary simplicity of a screenplay, 
it's incredibly reductive. It's, it's you know, you, and this is where the, the concept of a biopic fails you completely as a genre. It's not a useful genre. I love working in useful genres. For me with this film, the, the heist film as applied to the Manhattan Project, the courtroom drama as applied to the security hearings, it's very useful to look at the conventions of those genres and how they can pull the audience, how, how they can give me communication with the audience. Biopic is something that tends to be applied to a film that's not quite registering in a dramatic fashion. That is to say, you don't talk about Lawrence of Arabia as a biopic. You don't talk about Citizen Kane as a biopic. They're just, it's an adventure film. It's a, you know, a film about somebody's life, but it, it, it's, not, it's not a useful genre. The same way drama is not a useful genre. It doesn't give you anything to hold on to. And so, scenes of childhood, if you were writing a different form, if you were writing you know, a mini-series or a 12-hour television program, you know, whatever, um, yes, you could give those things the depth that they need to balance against the much more important things that are happening later in his life. Uh, but in the reductive form of a theatrical screenplay, to me, they always were going to lead you down the wrong path. And the, the scene with the poison apple is so dramatic a representation of this late blooming neurosis, the difficulties faced as a young man, and how his professional achievement eventually and his relationships eventually were able to change that for him. Um, I just focused very much on that. Very interesting answer. I, I quite agree. So here, here are a couple of questions from the audience. Um, Tarkovsky has said, quote, filmmaking is the sculpting of time. As, as a director, this quote seems to be, seems to describe your work, both formally and narratively. Can you explain your personal attraction to the metaphysics of temporality? And if you see <laughs> that theme in Oppenheimer. This is an academic audience I here. was gonna say. <laughs> It's a very fancy question, but it's, uh, it's a question I've been asked a lot, actually, about, you know, why, why am I so interested in time, to which my glib answer is, well, I've always lived in it. <laughs> and it sounds glib, but it's, it's the truth. It's, it's the most fundamental part of our human experience is how we perceive the world as defined by time. And cinema is uniquely uh, suited to, to dealing with it. Um, some years ago, I wrote a, a thing for Wired magazine. We were talking about time and its relationship with cinema. And I was talking about the, if, you, if you've ever been in a, in a projection booth when a film is running, and if, you know, as I have seen sometimes, the film comes off the spool and starts going out onto the floor, you've never seen such a dramatic representation of time and the flow of time. It's, it's terrifying, especially with an IMAX print that's running... <laughs> You know, our, our three-hour IMAX print is 11 miles long. That's a lot of time, you know, on this big platter. And so I actually think the mechanism of time, the way that conventional film grammar deals with time and the portrayal of time is incredibly sophisticated. And the films I make are actually much cruder. They actually demonstrate the mechanism. They, they bring attention to the mechanism. Um, and I think the relationship between time and films you know, as our friend Tasta Dean, who we referred to, she explains to you that the camera is a time machine. It captures time. No one before the film camera came along had ever seen something backwards or had ever seen something in slow motion or fast motion. You know, we, you know I went to a screening at MoMA of Kiana Scottsy the other, the other night, and that's a film. I don't know how many people in the audience know it well, but it just looks at the world in a different way through the manipulation of time via the movie camera. It's only possible with a movie camera. Um, and so it's pure cinema to me, and that's why it's a, a useful subject, I think. Okay, here's, an, here's another question. Um, sound, not time, but sound plays a huge por part in your films, even silence, because of how important it is in the final product. What do you listen to when you write? <laughs> I listen to a lot of things. Uh, I listen to a lot of music when I write, um, not all the time, um, but I found many years ago that if I, as I'm embarking on a project, if I associate it orally with a piece of music that I'm listening to as I write, um, 
listening to that music at a later date will put me back into the groove of, of writing that particular project. So I use music, um, uh, a lot of classical music, a lot of film score, a lot of, I mean, a bit of everything really, but, but I do try to make certain associations with some of the things I'm writing because it's helpful to me to remind me of a particular mood that I'm trying to reach or a particular association. What do you listen to when you write? Kind of interesting. Uh, U2, <laughs> Bruce Springsteen. Oh. If I get stuck in writing something, I just crank up the music, put on some Bruce, and somehow something clicks in my brain, and, it, and I ignore the music, and I just start writing. Huh. It's it was weird. a bit of Born in the <laughs> USA with Oppenheimer, I think. <laughs> you felt that. <laughs> All right, let's see. Uh, here's another one. Um, many of your movies explore how technology can affect human lives. Do you have a sense of how AI should be used in, movie, in the movie industry? What ethical principles should be adopted by the industry with respect to this new powerful invention? Uh, excellent question. Um, one of the reasons that our SAG and AFTRA brothers and sisters are still on strike because they're trying to come to the same kind of language and accommodation around this issue that the writers and the directors have. Um, in, in brief, for me, it's about treating AI as a tool, not as an absolute or as a human consciousness. And um, a lot of our contractual protections were already there as long as you think of AI as a tool. Um, over the last 20 years or so, I've watched with unease the word algorithm used more and more colloquially by people who don't actually understand or wouldn't even be able to tell you what an algorithm is. And in, in business, a lot of companies, a lot of organizations, the word algorithm has come to be a simple way of evading any responsibility for their actions. And they're going to do the same with AI. And so I think actually what the DGA and the WGA have already got in place in the contract, uh, and SAG hopefully will get something even stronger because they're very much at threat for this. Uh, it's about having it as a tool and not viewing it as, as an absolute. And so as long as it's a tool that writers, directors, and actors can choose to use, can choose to control, it's going to produce very, very interesting results and it's going to be a very useful tool. Um, but it's very important that, that we control that and control how it's used. Yeah, I think that's true for biographers too, and copyright laws, and you know, we're, we need to find a way to regulate all this. Okay, so let's, uh, let's, one more question here. Oppenheimer, the film, seems to conclude on a rather pessimistic, dystopian note. What did you hope audiences would take away from the film ideologically, i.e. in regards to nuclear war, climate change, uh, humanity's ability to destroy itself. Uh, I'm feel, sorry feel, to... Feel good movie of the summer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I wanted the end... We, my editor, Jen Lame, and myself, we spent more time cutting the end of the film than any other part of the film, which isn't usually the case, because the ending was very tightly scripted, the imagery was you know, carefully put together, um, and so we had a very good version of it very early on, and quite often you then don't touch the ending because you, you've got it in the bag and then it's about making the rest of the film lead to it. But with just frames here and there, with sync on the music, with what Ludwig was doing on the track, Ludwig Göransson, our composer, um, it would very easily become a didactic sequence, some kind of message at the end of the film. And for me, I wanted it to stay within the experience of the character. And so it's the summation you know, of the characters experience, their feeling and all the rest. And, you know, my feeling was that it would be both energizing and utterly depressing at the same time. And I don't know exactly what that is. I, like in musical terms, it's, it would be an interesting clash. And I think what Ludwig is doing in the music there is, is very important to it. And it took him a long time to get, get that just right. Um, and so, yeah, it's a big swing at the end to send the audience out feeling, you know, something, I mean, I think despair is not a bad, I, there's a nihilism to this story that is unshakable. 
Um, and everything, if, if you look at the way that we've made the film, everything is fighting against that nihilism. Killian's performance, everything is fighting against it the whole way through. So the first time they learn of the atom being split, Alvarez, Louis Alvarez reproduces the experiment. According to the, a great book I've read, within 15 minutes or so, Oppenheimer's like, yeah, you could make a bomb. We portray that in the film, and when Killian and I talked about the moment and how to do that and everything, it's, it's like, no, there's, there's no, he's not aware of where this is going at this point. It's exciting for him. It's not about despair. It's not about, everything in the film is about the energy of discovery and you know, the, the theatrical way in which he's engaging with the world and finding his power that way. It's all very positive because at the end of the day, the story itself is the most nihilistic story imaginable. And so we always knew that, that there's, no, there's no way out of this film without that. Um, and so we really tried to play against it right up until the end and then let that, kind of really let that sing out at the end. So we're, we're always going to be living in the atomic age. Yeah. And well. on that happy note, thank you, Chris <laughs> and Emma. <laughs> this has been wonderful. Thank you.